Hello, I'd like to thank Amber and Brian, as well as Sages for the kind invitation to discuss gastrectomy for gastroparesis, which operation and when. Uh, this uh, really is a great session and I'm, I'm happy to have the last word on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been managing patients with gastroparesis since 2013 and of all the diseases I treat, uh, this is perhaps one of the more exciting fields with all the advancements that have occurred even in the last five years. I have no, nothing to disclose. So today I'll go through the indications and workup, the setup and basic steps, some tips and tricks, complications and aftercare, and finally what I believe to be uh, special considerations in, in relation to this disease. So first in terms of indications, I think it's helpful for the surgeon to answer three questions. Number one, what is the etiology? Because I do tailor the approach based on this somewhat. Number two, have I exhausted all other options? And number three, why am I considering gastrectomy? I often tell trainees that management of gastroparesis is a lot like that of peripheral artery disease and limb salvage. And I think we would do well to learn from our vascular surgery colleagues who really throw the book at these patients to preserve their limbs. And I think in a similar fashion, in formal gastrectomy, we, si we significantly alter a patient's life and it's really a big jump to take in a benign disorder. Just over five years ago, this manuscript described a very thoughtful approach to offering gastrectomy for refractory gastroparesis. I have to admit it's one of my favorite papers, not only because it is written by my good friend, Neil Bayani, and many other colleagues from Lee Swanstrom's group in Oregon, but also because it paints a realistic picture of what performing gastrectomy for gastroparesis looks like. In their series of 35 patients who had exhausted all other available options, there was a fairly distribution, even distribution of etiologies, and most of the patients had a near total gastrectomy with Ruin Y GJ. Interestingly, 17% experienced leaks that required reoperation, but ultimately most patients did well and had a statistically significant improvement in symptoms of nausea, belching, and bloating. The authors concluded that while morbidity is high in this complex patient group, at a high volume center, patients could be managed well with improvement of symptoms. Well, we've already heard about what is new in 2020 with probably the greatest advancement being the addition of POP as discussed previously by Sal Dosimo. And because of the data supporting this novel endoscopic surgical option, I now use the following algorithm for my patients. First line therapy is almost always lesser curvature POP. Second line therapy is greater curvature POP and the other options discussed in this session with the caveat that those with post-surgical gastroparesis do not meet FDA criteria for gastric stimulator. For those interested in some uh, outcomes from repeated pyloric disruptions, I would turn your attention to Andrew Strong's video at this year's SAGES virtual session called Going Around the Clock Face, Third Time Pyloric Dysfunction with Redo Per Oral Pyloromyotomy. For that specific patient, symptoms are well controlled without undergoing gastrectomy. And that's ultimately the third line. For the workup, as Kate uh, previously discussed, these patients should be evaluated with a standardized gastroparesis cardinal symptom index, or GCSI. And the outcomes should really note the improvements of these three subscores, nausea and vomiting, fullness and early satiety, and bloating. And anyone being considered for a gastrectomy should also get preoperative EGD, noting any anatomical disturbances such as hiatal hernia, recurrence after prior fundoblications, mechanical obstructions or peptic strictures, and whether they have a large food visor, as these patients should be managed with a prolonged clear liquid diet prior to gastrectomy. Sometimes they'll even require a gastric lavage. Both a four hour gastric emptying scintigraphy, as well as a wireless motility capsule can aid in distinguishing patients with isolated gastroparesis versus those with concomitant intestinal dysmotility, which can arise in 30% of patients. I routinely also get CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, especially patients with post-surgical gastroparesis or prior fundoplication. Once I've decided to take a patient to surgery, the first decision is approach. And I think either a laparoscopic or robotic approach is reasonable, depending on the surgeon's resources and training. I perform these operations with the patients in a supine position with a general trocar placement as noted, typically a gentle U with fives and 10 millimeter trocars for suture passing 
if possible to do it with a five millimeter camera. And when using the EEA for uh, a, um, either an esophagogigian ostomy or a linear a circular anastomosis, this left uh, sided port gets upside to, upsized to 15 millimeters. The basic steps are as follows. Number one, greater curvature mobilization. Number two, distal staple line choice, whether antrum or duodenum. Number three, proximal staple line, whether proximal stomach or distal esophagus. Next, the jejunojejunostomy, deciding on EJ versus a GJ. Uh, I perform intraoperative endoscopy. And then an optional discussion is whether or not the patient should have a feeding tube placed at that time nasal jejunal, remnant G-tube, or J-tube. For, for the next few minutes, I'll highlight some of the technical aspects of the operation with accompanying video. Uh, for the greater curvature mobilization, you'll note in this patient of both the prior pyloroplasty as well as gastric stimulator, highlighting my earlier comments about exhausting all prior options. For greater curvature mobilization, and, and for many of my operations now, I prefer the Maryland Tip Advanced Bipolar Device. The plume is less than that of the ultrasonic shears, and with a five millimeter camera, this is very helpful. I find hemostasis to be better and more controlled as well. And the mobilization is much like that of a gastric sleeve, where you can stay very close to the stomach wall. Next, I dissect under the duodenum and transect the duodenum, and then the gastroepiploic bundle. Uh, different from performing a gastrectomy for cancer, you don't have to dissect down to the junction of the gastroepiploic vein, with the superior mesenteric vein. So taking the artery and vein on block is a, is a reasonable way as shown here. In patients with prior, for, prior foregut surgery, I prefer to leave a small pouch, much like that seen in gastric bypass, based off the lesser curvature vessels, preserving the left gastric artery, the initial fire with the staple line reinforcement on the descending branch of the left gastric, followed by 60 millimeter firing horizontally, and then two fires vertically. Here I think also getting rid of the debris at the staple line crotch is important to avoid uh, staple line misfiring. And this would be the final fire uh, in a vertical fashion to create a small pouch. The jejunojejunostomy is much like that uh, performed for a gastric bypass for those who are familiar with that. This is performed in a side-to-side -side fashion using a 60 millimeter vascular endoscopic GIA stapler between an absorbable and permanent suture with the needles left on. The common enterotomy is then closed in a running fashion and tied to the tail of the permanent suture. That permanent suture is then used to close the mesenteric defect in a running, locking fashion. The next choice is deciding whether to go anticolic or retrocolic, and again, depending on the size of the patient, uh, whether or not uh, there's gonna be some reach issues, uh, that, that decision can be made as well. For the gastrogenostomy, I've moved away from uh, stapled anastomoses in the last five years or so, now preferring to use a hand-sewn technique. Here with 3-0 absorbable barbed suture, first to line up the anastomosis from the jejunum to the horizontal staple line. After that, a gastrotomy is made. Um, it's helpful in these cases to perform endoscopy with uh, insufflation to provide some traction and counter-traction. Um, I think uh, this is nice to, especially given how thick the stomach can be, and can also kind of help you calibrate the diameter using the scope as a guide. Similar size jejunotomy is then made using hook electrocautery and using two additional 3-0 uh, absorbable barbed sutures, uh, an inner layer and an outer layer are then sewn in a running fashion and finally, they are turned the corner and sewn anteriorly. Um, I don't generally do a second layer anteriorly, but if there is a, a leak uh, on the endoscopy, uh, this can be over sewn with the uh, 2 ovicral. I have to switch to, to using this uh, V-lock in, in a lot of my poor gut operations now. Regarding complications and aftercare, uh, perioperatively, the, the top two complications are, are bleeding, uh, leaks, you can also see DVT, and, and rates can range from 5 to 40%, uh, especially when you think of the severity, obviously 40% for minor complications, 5% to 10% for major. From a midterm standpoint, uh, uh, strictures and ulcerations can occur from 
uh, anywhere from five to 10% of the time. If there's ever any uh, hesitation about the quality of the tissue, um, I won't hesitate to place drains, but in these cases, I'll, I'll generally avoid drains. Um, Long-term complications include anastomotic ulcerations, uh, as well as internal herniation, as well as jejuno jejunostomy into susception. And while they're both rare, uh, once you do this long enough, uh, you'll definitely see these. I've seen both of them, and it's important to have a low index of suspicion in patients with chronic pain uh, and potentially normal imaging. Aftercare for patients is similar to anyone with post-gastrectomy uh, anatomy or gastric bypass. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, if perform a GCSI score on these patients closely. They do generally get an upper GI series on post-operative day one. And then from a standpoint of the follow-up, multivitamin and nutritional follow-up with yearly evaluations and labs. Uh, for the special considerations that often come up when discussing uh, gastrectomy for gastroparesis, one of these is whether or not to perform a formal uh, gastrectomy or to leave the stomach in situ, much like what is done with a gastric bypass. This work by our research fellow uh, in years past, Joshua Landernow, was presented at SAGES and published in Surgical Endoscopy last year. And while many reports on this topic were relatively smaller series, this was really the first and largest comparative study here with a total of 53 patients. 27 who underwent RU and Y with stomach left in situ, and 26 who underwent formal gastrectomy. And what we found was that from a symptom score standpoint, the outcomes were equivalent uh, with 80 to 90% improvement. Interestingly, however, GCSIs were still about the 2.5 range, which, which is what we see in a lot of the data for POP and pyloroplasty. Uh, we did find that from a operative time, blood loss, complication, and length of stay, stomach left in situ group was uh, superior. However, future surgery was acquired in 23% of the co cohort uh, that underwent surgery in situ, one of which was a remnant gastrectomy. So ultimately, uh, I would commend this manuscript to any surgeon who's considering gastrectomy for gastroparesis, as I think it can help us to, to really help figure out what to expect when tailoring the approach to the specific patient. A final consideration is a question of sleeve gastrectomy, which has been anecdotally discussed and presented at SAGE's meetings in the past. This manuscript, manuscript reports on 19 patients who underwent primary sleeve gastrectomy for the indication of medically refractory gastroparesis. The perioperative morbidity was low at 11%. Um, instead of GCSI, the authors used a GI quality uh, index score that showed an improvement with 125 being considered normal and a stable BMI after the operation. Ultimately, at one year, uh, three patients or 20% of those that had follow-up required a formal gastrectomy. So based on the anecdotal reports and this published data, I would consider sleeve gastrectomy for gastroparesis experimental, and we would need more data to justify offering it as a first-line therapy at this time. In conclusion, uh, as we've learned from this session, gastroparesis remains a complex disorder to manage. When addressing the assigned questions regarding gastrectomy, first, which operation? Well, while there's no one size fits all, I would have to say that the go-to definitive operation in this case is a subtotal gastrectomy with ruin y GJ. I would add the caveat of this being performed ideally in a high volume center with experience in managing the high rate of postoperative complications. A reasonable alternative is to perform ruin y with stomach left in situ, or a sleeve gastrectomy within an IRB approved protocol with an aim to publish long-term data. The second is when? Well, only after exhausting all organ sparing options first as listed here in this 2020 algorithm, ideally with Sal Dosimo doing a POP and Jenna Wishnu doing a pyloroplasty or gastric stimulator, potentially even a repop. And to better highlight this, I would uh, alert viewers uh, to Michael Klingler's video at this year's SAGE's virtual meeting titled, An Odyssey into the Surgical Treatment of Gastroparesis. This video nicely summarizes the over seven year journey of a patient who had all of these therapies and unfortunately many of the complications associated with each of them. So with that, I'll close and thank you all very much for your attention. I'd be happy to connect with anyone who wants to discuss this topic further or has a case they'd like me to review. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Uh, and I hope to see everyone at SAGES in Vegas next year. Take care.